Yoda, and welcome to the Beer Jack Beer of the Week Drink Along. I'm Luke, and this week we're drinking Hippie Berliner from Eight Wide, uh, which has been around for a while now. Um, I looked it up before, and it's uh, it was first launched in 2015, so a uh, nine-year-old beer, and it's a um, uh, it's a Berliner Weisser, <sighs> but not a very classic Berliner Weisser. Uh, it's sort of I think it even says in the can. It's kind of a mashup between a traditional Berliner Weisse and a hoppy American pale ale sort of beer. Uh, really heavy goes for hops. Um, so a nice, yeah, a nice mashup with the real good tartness, the refreshingness, just the light, crisp, effervescent, all those good things that you love in a Berliner Weisse uh, with a hefty amount of aromatic hops. And it's um, quite a rare thing to see these days. Uh, a brewer releasing a kettle sour, but managing to hold back on adding fruit. Uh, as we talk about sometimes with uh, stouts and imperial stouts, uh, yeah, brewers just can't help themselves uh, to find this lovely tart, sparkling base. Uh, and you do just want to add additional interesting flavors. Uh, so, well, I mean, that's what a white have done here with hops rather than fruit. Uh, so, yeah, let's rewind a little bit. Uh, so Berliner Weisse, known as the Champagne of the North. So that was the traditional beer style from, uh, you guessed it, Berlin and the areas around there. And it dates back to, well, written records of Berliner Weisse date back to the 1600s, but obviously the beer would date back far further than that. Um, and it's a beer made with, uh, with barley malt and with wheat. Uh, often about 50-50, so it gives it, um, uh, yeah, like a lovely bit of bit of body, bit of uh, character from the wheat, a bit of interest, and uh, then um, lactic acid, so lactobacillus. Uh, originally, it would have been um, well, like all beers before yeast was isolated by old mate Louis Pasteur. Uh, it would have been fermented with whatever yeast fell in the pots. Uh, so various kinds of Brassanomyces. So those beers that we were drinking hundreds of years ago wouldn't quite have tasted like this because this is a beer made with a clean yeast. Uh, of modern brewer's yeast. So uh, definitely those beers would have been uh, a lot more funky uh, than the, the interpretations that we generally drink today in it. Um, those beers would have had a real microflora, which obviously uh, is still the case with, with all beers, um, but the, the, there's the um, sort of the yeast and bacteria is sort of like a symbiotic organism working together uh, to ferment the beer, to make it food, and to give it interesting flavour. And you might be wondering why brewers were allowed to put wheat in their beer in the 1600s. In Germany, when the Reinhardt's of 1516 very clearly stated that brewers were only allowed to use barley and hops and water. Uh, and after the discovery of yeast, uh, a couple of centuries later, yeast was added to that uh, very strict rule of what you're allowed to brew with the, uh, those German purity laws. Um, but the thing is, the Reinhardt's Gebot was a Bavarian law. Uh, and Berlin is not in Bavaria. In fact, Germany didn't exist as a country back in those days. Uh, so in other parts of the country, they could do what they wanted. It wasn't until the late 19th century where the German purity law spread out to all of Germany. Uh, but of course, beers like this uh, would have been grandfathered in because they've been around for many years. So there was no way that we were just going to stop brewing Berliner Weisse uh, just because of the purity law. So that purity law came into place originally uh, to protect wheat uh, so that the um, uh, the bakers wouldn't be priced out of the market when it came to buying uh, rye and wheat primarily. So it was dedicated that only barley could be used to make beer and no other grains. Uh, but yeah, various exceptions through Germany. So uh, famously Goza, who uses salt water and coriander, also wouldn't have been, uh, been able to uh, be made with those laws. And, and also you might be thinking about the, the wheat beers that are famously from Bavaria. 
Um, but with the sort of a loophole, they were allowed to be made by the nobles, and that was uh, sort of how they made their income. That the uh, the very finest the beers that were made from wheat could only be brewed by the uh, the noble be the noble folks. Uh, so that that's uh, it was very limited, and they could make their income. And then it was uh, years later that common people were allowed to make wheat beers, uh, starting with. I believe probably would have been. Anyway, we're not talking about uh, wheat beers, we're talking about Berliner Weisse. So yeah, as I say, the Champagne of the North. And I love the idea that in the olden days, from town to town and region to region, you'd turn up at different places, and that's just what the beer was. You just drank the local beer. You asked for a glass of beer, and if you were around Berlin a uh, hundred or so years ago, you'd have had something that tastes a bit like this. Um, perhaps they would have imported some other beer styles from around the country, but the majority of what you were drinking was going to be that local Berliner Weisse. Uh, the same as if you're around Burton, you'd have drank a certain kind of beer. Uh, or if you're in Brussels, you'd have drank a certain kind of beer. And um, yeah, it's kind of funny to think about this sort of regionalism and travellers and merchants going to different places and just uh, falling in love with a certain beer styles in different places or being grossed out uh, because this uh, is a very far cry from a Burton Ale. Um, yes, yeah, so these days we, uh, I suppose the, uh, the craft beer revolution uh, around the, uh, maybe around 2010s where some American brewers, the, the Goza, uh, maybe there was Berlin and Kindle still being brewed at that time but Berliner Weisse had effectively died out. And it just became, it just went on the decline. Uh, it became really unfashionable. Traditionally, Berliner Weisse is a very low ABV beer. Uh, so it would be around two or 3%. This one is 4%. So it's uh, dosed up for our modern palates. These days, we just like a little bit more booze. Uh, and probably because we, we drink a lot less. Uh, we're not drinking this uh, by the, many litre load, we're just drinking a glass or two, so maybe we want a little bit more of a kick in our beers these days. Uh, so it was really low ABV and um, more high ABV beers uh, became more fashionable for the 1900s uh, as pills and lagers became really popular throughout Germany, throughout the whole world, and it was seen as quite an archaic thing, the same as both milk stouts were in Britain and just virtually died off. Um, and also importantly, Throughout the history of Berliner Weisse, it's most commonly been ordered mit Schuss, uh, which means uh, with a shot. And you'd order it at a bar and they'd, uh, they'd serve it with a shot of Woodruff syrup uh, or of uh, raspberry syrup. And it would turn your beer bright green or bright red, depending on what the choice was. And it became a sweet drink. Uh, so again, uh, sometimes we think about history and we think about the uh, how it would have been just really really straight, really boring, uh, just German purity law, can't be much interesting, but absolutely they were chucking sweet things into the beer. So if you're a uh, straight-laced modern beer drinker that looks down on people drinking all these uh, these childish beers with all kinds of fruits added, uh, that is definitely not unusual in people doing that for many hundreds of years. Um, but through the 1900s, that was another characteristic uh, that led people to thinking it was kind of childish to go into the pub and, and order a, a low alcohol beer with raspberry syrup in it. Uh, so perhaps, you know, macho blokes that were drinking beers, that would have been more inclined uh, to order a different kind of beer rather than a Berliner Weisse. Um, and yeah, thinking about the additions to beers, it's nice to have something that's that's clean and it's the uh, sort of essence you're getting the flavour, you're getting the, you're getting the tartness, you're getting the, the acidity, the real refreshingness. Uh, it's sometimes a nice drink of beer that doesn't necessarily have fruit on top of it. It's, uh, I suppose it's sort of a bit like how, um, how Americans talk about things being vanilla and what they mean by vanilla is having no flavour uh, because I don't know, maybe they don't have vanilla flavour things in America, they just have white ice cream. Um, I don't know, I'm ranting now, but really vanilla the best flavour uh, or anything. Um, so excellent beer from 8Wired. Uh, you probably know a bit about 8Wired if you watch our videos. They're good friends of ours. 
their uh, up north Auckland in Walkworth. They've got their uh, their Bowery Matakana, really fantastic place to visit. Uh, it's uh, Soren, who's the founder and head brewer there, who's a, a lovely Danish guy that's um, just super knowledgeable, really, really passionate about historic beer styles and experimentation, uh, European beer styles. So yeah, it's always brilliant to see when Eight Wider coming out with, you know, a, a, well, they made a person ale a year or so ago. It's one of the only ones I've known in New Zealand. Uh, their core range of Saison's great, their Italian pills is beautiful, uh, as well as obviously lots of different seasonal beers. So uh, yeah, uh, kind of a surprise when me and Joe were looking through the list and realized that we'd never had Hippie Berlin as a beer of the week before. So um, maybe you've tried this beer in the past and not recently. Maybe it's a favorite of yours, but uh, irregardless, I hope you enjoy it. Cheers for joining us. Um, news, I think we mentioned last week, uh, we put the fresh hop boxes on pre-sale on the website. So we're currently chatting to all the brewers about curating the different beers for the fresh hop box. Uh, and there also will be the, the fresh hop festival in Auckland again this year. So that'll be here at the Bridge of Blaggan and at Galbraiths and at the Lumsden. So there's going to be a whole load of beers all getting launched on the same day. Uh, so that's always a highlight of a lot of people's years. Uh, so the Fresh Hot Box. Um, yeah, we're getting some really cool beers, beers that are not going to be commonly available. Uh, it's a really, really cool selection. And as we talk to the brewers, a lot of brewers do half batches for these Fresh Hot beers. And they basically want the beers to be pre-sold and just gone uh, on the day they get packaged. So they're giving us the hard word at the moment, asking us what our volume is going to be, and they're not sure if they're going to be able to have enough cans for us. So if you haven't yet got your pre-order in, uh, it is a limited number of the boxes. So get that in shortly. Anyway, thanks for joining us. See you next time. Cheers.